Good day and welcome to Office Hours. If you are watching us on YouTube, welcome. And if you want to learn more about what we do here, head over to officehours.global. You'll get an idea of our community and the schedule for events this week. And just to give you insight on what we do here, the first hour is general questions around media and virtual events. The second hour is typically something that we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we'll be talking about branding and visual communications and what it takes to really have your brand and your identity out into cyberspace. And if you are watching right now and you're a producer, feel free to add your questions for our illustrious panel to answer them during our first and second hour. All right, Bill, let's get the show started. Thanks, Liberty. Our first question comes from panelist Mitchell Hill in Wilmington, Delaware. He says a friend wants to play video for a funeral service via VLC. How can he also play audio over a Zoom call? Let's start with Courtney. Well, it depends, as Mickey says. You got to make sure that your <clears throat> your computer is selected. Uh, the output of your computer mixer is selected as the audio input device. Or you could share. He could share screen, but I'm not sure he wants to do that. I guess he does want to do that since he's playing back a video via VLC. That may be the best way to ensure that he gets the audio over. I think if you do a screen share, it then pipes the audio in. Uh, otherwise, you just have to make sure that uh, do a test make sure that the VLC audio is coming over. If he has a separate microphone plugged in through a USB device, it may may not come in. So you have to use the output of the computer's mix panel, or if you're using a Macintosh, you have to aggregate the audio or make sure it is going in to your Zoom feed. All right, Mitchell? Yeah, that's probably the issue is that he wants to know, how do I, you know, I, I mentioned loopback, but uh, he doesn't want to deal with uh, that complication. So he wants to be able to um, play his audio from his microphone and from the VLC output. And I guess the only way you can do that is use the computer uh, as the audio source. And in VLC, I guess you can select that. And then um, in the uh, Zoom call, just do a share. And that, that should, should work. It. I think that's why I'm checking. Go ahead, Alex. There's a high probability it won't work unless you use Loopback. Like, like, you know, like it's just, um, you know, when you want to do playback and then you want to do mics and then you want to have it play out to something external and you want it to play to Zoom on a Mac, at least you really should be using loopback. And if you shouldn't, you should try to figure out something else. I mean, it, then it gets more hardware and things flying in, you know, like it's if they just want to do it off of a computer, loopback is the right solution for them. Pulling in the comments, Mickey Makachor says that just share computer audio, but would we have some, wouldn't that have some but, feedback but issue? You could yeah. share computer audio, The you, and then you theoretically could talk over top of it as you're doing the screen share. It just gets, it's going to get really convoluted, more, much more convoluted than loopback. So, but he's right. He could, you could play it, play it out as we could share a screen and share computer audio and you should be able to talk over it. You need to practice it a lot, but it's really easy with the loopback. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, hopefully Unless you're not have on a Mac, time. and if, if you're not on a Mac, not a Mac. Then it's really hard to use magic. Good ad. Thank you, Courtney. Next question. John Foltz in Seedlings Grove, Pennsylvania is up next. He says NVIDIA posted a special address at SIGGRAPH last thir uh, Tuesday. Excuse me. They are leaning into USDZs in a gigantic way. The demos of many uses in high resolution were compelling. What's the impact of all this? And he has a YouTube link there to watch what he's talking about. Go ahead, Alex. So I did uh, check out the YouTube link because it was posted nice and early. So I was able to look at it uh, in the pre-show. Uh, so they're, I just want to distinguish. They're not talking about USDZ or I didn't see them mention USDZ in this presentation. Uh, what they are talking about is USD. So USD is universal scene description. And that was created by, um, in, uh, that was created by Pixar, I, think, I believe. And it's an open format and a lot of people are using it. And it's really seen as the, future of what we're doing, you know, of, of, uh, of computer graphics, as far as transporting entire scene files, animation, so on and so forth. The USDZ, um, which is what Apple is pushing forward is a USD file that's zipped. <laughs> so if you zip it, that's what the Z at the end means. Um, and so if it's zipped into a self self-contained container, 
so now you don't have a folder structure. You really have something you can just, you can pass around and Apple's treating that like a file format. Um, and so that is, uh, it's very convenient. Um, it is going to be the future. There's a lot of people using USDZ, uh, USD, I mean USD, and some people using USDZ, including Apple. And so it's, it does make it much easier in the future for Apple to basically coexist with lots of other, the reason, part of the reason it's great for Apple to do this is because it's not very hard to go from USDZ to USDZ, or USD to USDZ is really an easy uh, transport. So it just means that um, all the file formats that are being used are gonna be supported. Go ahead, Bill. I was just interesting, Alex. Interested, Alex? Is the is the issue with USDZ that the Apple tools can look into it, sort of like a PDF yeah. reader doesn't have to open the PDF. You can actually just look into it and work with yeah, it. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. it. It's it's a it's a it's a folder. It's a file, not a container. Um, and it is a uh, you know so it, it can be it's easy to pass around. It's easy to send, so on and so forth. But what the OS does, literally at the OS level, is it just looks right into it. Um, and grabs onto the assets that it needs. And John, so Fredo? at at, NV, at uh, Nvidia's last keynote, they talked about this this uh, initiative, which is uh, a giant step into AI. And so AI is going to power tons of stuff, as as they show in this video. Yeah. Uh, but if you go back and watch this keynote, they explain the whole architecture of where they're moving towards. It's amazing, amazing. Yeah, you kind of have to walk through, you know, wade through the fairly flat presentations, um, you know, to, to to just try to glean out the information. The information itself is really interesting. It was a little hard to watch the people actually talking, um, but the uh, but it is, um, and that's something that I think that Nvidia needs to improve if they're going to do these big kind of uh, layouts. But anyway, the the quality of the of what they're doing is pretty interesting and they're using ai and apple's doing this and a lot of other folks are doing it um they're using the ai to uh, build you know parametric controls where it's just you, you hand it a couple photos and it figure the ai figures out the rest it's not just kind of quickly doing something it's really doing much more complex operations to make to make decisions about geometry you know i think that if you we were to, some of us were just talking about it over the weekend with like metahuman right now you have to build a photogrammetry model of your face and then you have to, you know, there's a process to meld it kind of into MetaHuman that we're probably only a year or two away from you get like three photos of somebody and you can build a meta MetaHuman of, of them. You know, it's because the, the AI will will solve all that and it'll either be by Epic or by, um, by NVIDIA. Nice, next question. Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana comes up next. So what should an office hours radio look like? And he's got a link there to a hackaday.com radio receiver for streaming. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, that's a cool little uh, little radio. It's a little tiny thing with a headphone jack on the top of it. I think uh, we have a graphic of it so we can show you. Um, it looks more like a personal radio receiver. So if you want a device that you can uh, travel with and... Um, uh, uh, listen at any time i don't think it would work so much there and i'm not sure if that's a kit or not i believe it's a kit made in, into a plastic box so it's kind of cool if you want to go with something that uh, would plug into your like your stereo um you would use something like this which is the uh, uh the barracks device which uh, works really well with streaming and i think the best solution if we wanted to do uh, audio streaming of, of office hours uh, would be to get into TuneIn Radio because it's just sort of a standard everybody uses, including iHeartMedia. Um, it's just an easy way to get into, and that will will play into many different types of boxes, including your car radio. Go ahead, Alex. How does it play into your car radio? Uh, a lot of people have uh, AirPlay uh, in their car. Oh, okay, or you okay. Can, uh, I thought I thought it was like a radio. Your, it was actually the car could do it, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can you you can stream it with Bluetooth into your uh, car yeah. system. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Next question. Uh, from Liberty White in Atlanta, Georgia. What is the process of getting a producer credit for non-film projects? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, for non-film projects, you actually have to produce, which <laughs> means you, uh, uh, you either come up with the idea or finance the idea or option the idea, um, uh, secure the rights, organize the crew, raise the, you know, raise the money, uh, book the crew, book the director, uh, sign the writers. It depends on uh, what a non-film project is. 
And yeah, just a little context of like, we do so many digital projects and there was, um, it was a grant that we were looking at and they were just talking about various producer credits. And I think there was a past office hours where someone had mentioned, um, put it, uh, the IMDB link in that web series, you know, you can get credits for web series and things like that. So I was just curious as to is IMDB the place and the only place that you go and like you submit and show that you've got that credit. So I was just and and I'll ask another question since we <laughs> we can definitely use um, questions about points as well. But Alex, go ahead. Yeah. And, and the, the, you, you outlined the one reason that you need those is when you're f filing for grants. You know, grants are like, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, grants are connecting people, uh, uh, with idea, uh, connect, connecting people with ideas and no money to people with money and no ideas. And so, um, so you have to kind of just give them this little like list of things that they, that they, that they have to look at right. because, you know, the bottom line is, is that, you know, most of, most of the work that we get, I, mean, I don't really think about my credits that much, but, but most of the things that we get are from people that we know and they know what we know and they know how we know it. And, you know, and, and so the credits to me are not, you know, don't mean anything to me because I, I don't get hired from them. The right. one place you do get hired from them is grants. <laughs> you know, exactly. so, because you have people who don't know anything about what you're doing. They just have, maybe, yours might be different and your grant no, writer that, might be different. Yeah, that is exactly it. Because it's like, okay, well, you've got all, here's all this work for all these years. Oh, produce, I mean, yeah. Yes, we're yeah. the producer part, but thank you because you gave language to just them asking, um, asking for that when you clearly have shown samples. Yeah, it's, it's, they don't know anything about that. They don't understand. They don't understand that they don't under, you know, like they're, they're usually a finance person. <laughs> so they're, they're not a, they're not really a, uh, and, and they're good at what they do. Right. Um, but I, I do think that in general, um, large corporations and governments and grant writing and everything else, they have to have some reason to do this and they can't generally afford to have experts at everything, but it's kind of amazing how much they, well, I've been in this for a long time and watching people, the people who are able to write good grants and get grants all the time are rarely the people who are able to actually execute something great, you know, like, right. you know, like it's, you know, that, 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 that's been the, and so they, they kind of live together, the, the folks that don't understand what they're asking for and then folks that are really good at writing grants, but not necessarily at executing content. Um, and there are a handful, and I think you would be one if you get good at this. There's a handful that can do both, but it's, and they, they usually do pretty well, but it's, it's pretty rare in the, yeah. in the grant writing world. Everybody has their lane, which makes sense. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Well, somebody asked me this about a project not long ago, and it was interesting. I hadn't been on IMDb in a long time, and I have no credits there because I've never done a movie or a TV. I had thought that that's what exclusively what they uh, listed credits for. And when I actually got to the terms of service, they don't mention anything else other than feature films and television. Now, that's not to say that they haven't started doing that. But I wonder if they're thinking if we open it up to simply corporate productions or anything else, the potential is that they would triple or quadruple the number of uh, entries in the Internet Movie Database because there are so many people in so many corporate walks of life who are producers and are legitimately producing, uh, but you don't even see things like news show uh, TV producers. So it's pretty, at this point, what I've seen, it's pretty limited to feature film and episodic television in terms of IMDb credits. I may be wrong, but that's what I saw. Okay, and Courtney. Yeah, as far as IMDb goes, it's uh, basically screen credits. You can put uncredited in there, and a lot of actors <clears throat> appear as uncredited roles because in the early days, uh, a lot of uh, you know bit players that even had lines didn't get credit uh, because they were contract players. Um, lately, though, everyone gets a screen credit, and if you don't have a screen credit, it's a lot tougher to prove that you worked on a film if you don't actually appear in front of the camera. So it does require some kind of verification. A lot of times, if you were uncredited, you can submit a call sheet uh, to IMDb with your name on it in the position that you held. So that's one possible way. Another thing to think about is like uh, in the world of advertising, there are producers, directors, camera people, but nobody ever gets a credit on a television commercial and they play, you know, nationwide or worldwide sometimes. And I worked on thousands of television commercials and never received a credit. Uh, but, uh, you know, advertising age, you know, there are some uh, websites that uh, deal with the advertising area that will uh, credit people because they win awards. Uh, for right. doing those commercials. Uh, good ad. Thanks for that. Next question. 
Uh, Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, has anyone ever worked on LAWOMC2 consoles or LAWO, I guess? Uh, Lalo. Last time, LAWO, thank you. The last time I saw them at a reseller's expo, they were aggressively entering the live market. And uh, he notes here's one of their flagship church installations and has a link so that you can see what he's talking about. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, they're very uh, popular in broadcast, and I've seen them a lot in Europe, uh, not so much here in the U.S. of A., but uh, a friend of mine just installed his at the University of Delaware's radio station, so I've seen them. And I think it's Lalo. I'm not sure, but I, I heard him say that, so I'll stick with that for now. But uh, they're really into digital control, so it's a natural for them uh, to move into different uh, markets, particularly the live market. So. Um, I guess so. I mean, it just seems to make sense. Uh, they're sort of uh, uh, clawing out uh, another uh, uh, market space for themselves. Alex? Yeah, they usually position themselves kind of in the um, CalREC world, you know, like that that type of, that. those are the peers. So they're kind of at a different level from an expense perspective. Uh, very, very powerful mixers. And John? Now, looking at it from uh, the question before the, the show started, um, the Waves integration looked really great, which is awesome uh, for live production. Uh, you know, like the SC48, the Jigico stuff that they really don't really make anymore. Uh, seeing some of that integration come in here is really great to see in the touchscreens. Makes it look like a, a really great mixer. Next question. Next one comes to us from Alex Knight in Vancouver, Canada. As an alternative to Filmic Pro, the latest Shoot update now has a web-based remote control. Has anyone tested it yet? Go ahead, Alex. I have not been able to test the remote control. I think Shoot is a great app. I would look at it as a complementary app over Filmic as opposed to a replacement. Um, it has a lot of features that Filmic doesn't have. Um, I, I have both Shoot and Filmic. And it has a lot of features like the the telestrator and uh, you know the web based control, which is you know um, uh, filmic is a is an, another app based control, um, a, a, along with a Fenwick frame and lots of other things that are that are there. So uh, so it is I I would say both. I wouldn't say a replacement for them because filmic has a lot of shooting tools that shoot doesn't necessarily have. You know just just a lot of uh, intricate control over. Uh, over how you um, generate the content. So I would I would consider them both very useful apps to, to have for what we do. What would be the benefit of them having this web-based remote? Well, now you can use it, you can log into it. I mean, I have again, I haven't had time to test it. It's just been a busy, busy time for me, but but the, um, but the you can you can now open up a web page anywhere and um, and be able to control that phone. So being able to change, you know, it's, uh, you know, activate different features within it. Um, control the cameras, et cetera, which is, you know, really useful if you have a phone, let's say you take a phone with shoot and you put it somewhere that's hard to get to, or that you can't see it, you know, or, or for instance, if you use your, your cell phone as your web camera, making changes on it means you have to run over there and do it and then run back. You could theoretically just open up a web page and, and be able to make the adjustments that you need to make, you know, with it, which is, it's a big deal. A remote control of the phone is, I mean, of the, of a photo app is, almost a requirement. And, and that's why, again, when we talk about ecosystems, I tend to get cameras that I can remote control because I don't want to walk around and fix it and come back and see how it turned down, then walk around and fix it, come back. I, I need to control it. So having some kind of remote control over a camera is important. And then you could essentially have someone else on the team remote using it on the Theoretically, I, I think, you know, we there was a question that we had as whether you could do it. We think you could do it because just IP based, I believe um, you could theoretically do it over a VPN. <laughs> so, so, um, but, but we don't know that for sure. We'll have to test that in and come back. Thanks for yeah. that, Alex. Next question. Next one comes from our friend, Tony Mobley. And he says, panel, please help. I may have too much light. Go ahead, Tony. So last night I did the update of Filmic, uh, Filmic Pro. And to me, everything is kind of wacky in terms of the way I look. I'm not sure, really sure how to fix it. And so the, I, I, I was actually, when I got a, a, a negative vote, I was actually going to push it to notes and just ask the question in, in after hours. But since, <laughs> since it got pushed over, I, I'm going to go ahead and ask. And apologies for asking this particular question at this time. That's fine. We we can do a, a lab here. I see. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Let's see what you have to say. Yeah, Tony, I'm looking at you on my uh, scope here, and uh, you are crushing or clipping 
uh, the whites there. So I think overall the uh, the levels are hot. Uh, they should be substantially down. You can see on my screen there, I got a bright area there where it's all clipping. And Bill? Yeah, I do see there's there's some areas of white where there's no detail, but I got to tell you, you know, you are your skin tones are lighter than I might expect, but well within range. I mean, I can see you, I can see your eyes, I can see, you look good. There's a lot of white content in your shot. The shelves are white, you've got a lot of white in your shirt, the, the hair on the sides as mine is is turning closer to white. So, it's reading I don't. I don't think it's a bad picture. I agree. It could be dropped uh, just a little bit, maybe ten percent or twenty percent, and it might give you a better look. But there's nothing wrong, particularly with your face. I can see you, and I think that is the single biggest and most important thing we do is to, to have somebody be able to see you when you're talking to them through this kind of medium. And Alex. Yeah, I'm always actually a big a big proponent for thinking about having a background be. Like when you're thinking about the composition of your frame is to have your background a little darker than you are. Whatever your complexion is, you want your background to actually be darker because then you can expose your face exactly the way you want it without having to worry about it. So shirts, backgrounds, all those things. And no matter what someone's complexion is, to be honest, I would, we typically recommend against white. <laughs> like white is the, white is the, is the, the one, the one color that we try to, we tend to try to avoid because it has the effect that what Mitchell's talking about is you get to an exposure that works for you and your white levels are, are clipping. Um, and, and that is a, a very, very common problem for everyone. And so white is usually something you wanna try to avoid on a background. I know you've had this background for a long time. Um, so you'll either expose for that white or you'll expose for yourself and you just have to decide which one you're going to do. Um, I think that uh, with a darker background, you probably would find that your exposure's just fine. As, as Bill said, and just uh, is, is a good exposure. Um, it's just have, that you have the white behind you. It makes it feel a little, it looks a little out of focus as well. It, may, it looks like it may not be focused on you. I think I've seen that camera look a little sharper. So you may want to look at that. Otherwise, um, I would probably uh, close um, your, make sure that your gain is low. So turn down, you know, any ISO, you want to turn that down. And that should, um, the ISO should, should be the first thing that I would start turning down because that's going to make it darker. And it's also going to, to theoretically lower the grain, the amount of grain on, in the camera. You have very little now, but that's the first thing you do is move your move it, move that down. The second thing that I would do typically is then is then uh, make sure that my shutter is at you know one hundred what what we call one hundred eighty degrees, but the shutter speed should be twice the the uh, your frame rate. So if you're at thirty frames a second, your shutter should be at one sixtieth. And I know with Filmic Pro you can make those changes, and so it may have defaulted to something else. So that could be a, something you want to look at. So first the I, ISO, then the aperture, and then after that, you're pro or yeah, I'm sorry, first the ISO, then make sure shutter's set correctly. And then you may be um, either, you know, probably bringing your aperture, closing your aperture up a little bit to, to bring it down. And that's what Mickey said in the chat. I was just coming in to bring in that comment that he said, you need to adjust your exposure on Filmic Pro, namely the shutter speed and the, I, the ISO. So... Um, Alex helped with that that checklist there. So we'll look out for that, Tony. And as you said, if you need any other assistance, you can jump into After Hours and do some testing. I'm sure everyone could uh, benefit from Aperture ISO conversations and just working through that on something like Filmic Pro. Next question. Uh, Todd Perry in the old territorial capital of Arizona, Prescott, Arizona, says any tips for physically shipping kits out? Recommended couriers, return labels, packing instructions for clients? Alex? So I admit that we, we usually use some version of FedEx, you know, whether it's if we have enough time, it's going to be ground or three day or two day or other things like that. The ground is relatively inexpensive. Obviously, it gets more and more expensive as we run out of time. Um, but it, it has been the most reliable and the easiest for us to manage labels. You know, like I, I admit that managing labels is the thing that is more important to us than the cost. Um, and, and so uh, being able to, you know, a couple things about them is when you send out kits, you have to think about how easy it will be to pack them back up again. It's relatively easy to cut through something and pull it out. But is it obvious how you're going to put the kit back in the box? And is it going to be a tight fit? Or it's going to be something that you don't want to be loose, like falling around in the box, but you also don't want to be so tight that people don't, you know, it's suddenly frustrating because a kid can literally sit at somebody's house or not returned for weeks just because they couldn't close the box. You know, like, believe me, we've done that. We've had that issue. And so, so you have to be careful about how you pack them. 
Um, make sure that there's clear instructions on how to pack it back up and there might be a printout on the inside of the box as it's opened up. Um, always put in the return label. So the label will, you know, you'll put a return label in there, make sure that it's an obvious place, but something that's attached to the box on the inside or something. So they see it when they open it, but it doesn't, it's not something they have to lift and set somewhere because they'll lose it. You know, you, you know, it's, it's kind of surprising how quickly people can lose their, their, their the labels as they're opening them, things up and not really paying attention. Um, then, you know, so those are the big things is to make sure that it's clear of what, how to put it together when it comes out of the box and how to pack it back up with a return label. And then you usually want to research where someone can drop it off. So you like literally tell them and sometimes you'll put it in the in the in the map. You know, this is how you this is where to, where to take it. Uh, obviously, if they're a VIP, a lot of times we have someone just come pick pick it up. <laughs> someone just comes by and just grabs it from them, um, and uh, and takes it out. So it, it depends on on you know how what we're what we're doing and how we can and what our budgets are to make that happen. Um, then finally, uh, you will need often to need to follow up. Just make a phone call, like uh, usually the day after, the week after, a month after, and we find that uh, within the month we usually end up with. Uh, it's now over 90% return. So great tips, Courtney. Uh, yeah, Alex covered most of the points I was going to make as well. Um, FedEx, I agree with that for domestic shipping, DHL, if you have to go international. Um, and do not ship it via the postal service in the United States because you no, may not get there at all. <laughs> you, know, um, you won't know where it went. <laughs> another couple of tips is. Uh, um, after you, when you get the case ready to ship off to them, open the case, take a picture with your phone of everything in its place in the phone, print it out and put that in the sheet protector and put that in the case. So that they have a pictorial of where everything went and how it was stored when they got it. Uh, the other thing is if you have multiple cases, always number them on the outside, uh, one of, and then the number of cases is like one of four, two of four, three of four. And that way you can look at any case and know that you are expecting four cases. And if one's missing, you know which one's missing. So um, that's always a good tip. To always use a piece of two inch white tape with some nice black Sharpie on there that says one of how many cases it is, two of how many cases it is, et cetera. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, all, all of those are, are great tips. Um, one of the, th the other things is, is that we usually to assemble the kit, depending on how complicated the kit is, we'll have a printout of instructions in text with lots and lots of images. Or this is how you put it together. Um, the other thing we usually have is either a URL or a QR code that someone can type in and it goes to a video of how to produce it. And then sometimes we actually <laughs> build it with them if, if we need to. So those are the, you wanna think about those. The other thing to think about if you're putting these together is having enough room for um, little extras. So sending people, um, you, in what, what we do is we'll talk with our clients about, hey, is there anything you'd like to send? To, we're gonna send this out to 11 people that are probably pretty important because you're putting them on panels. Do you wanna send them a t-shirt, a coffee mug, stickers, cookies, you know, all, like all these other things. We have these complex kits that, that take a while to put together and we do put cookies in. in, in and when we're doing it with them, because this is one we do, it takes like 40 minutes to put together because it's a big kit with 6K camera and teleprompter. And they put it all together themselves and at the end it goes, and then the last step is like, there's a little white box in the last case and they open it up and it's cookies. And and they all talk about it, the fact that, that we sent cookies. So the, those little things are, um, uh, can be, uh, you know, sending lots of little extras. It's a great marketing area to do it because you're, it's not um, spammy. You're already sending them a kit. You're just adding a couple extra things that are kind of cool. And they get a reward for all their hard work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, that's led to that catchphrase, uh, take the cookies, leave the case. Hopefully they're returning <laughs> these things. Yeah, exactly. It's a great ca crash course in uh, sending out kits and marketing as well. Next question. Alex Knight in Vancouver, Canada is back with, does Roland not see black magic as a dangerous competitor? I like the build quality and balanced audio of my V1 HD plus switcher, but it clearly lacks a lot of features that ATEMs have. Mitchell? Well, I'm sure the people that have ATEMs covet some of those features because Roland's been at it for a while and they make great stuff. More solid, I think is the, is the word. I love the idea that they have balanced in and out because it is sorely missing from the uh, ATEM uh, mini line. And uh, I think that, uh, yeah, there's some, there's some features in the ATEM that the uh, Roland doesn't have. But the other thing is uh, that nice little 
T-bar. I love T-bars, and I'd like to have that uh, sitting in front of me on my A-10, but it's not there. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, they. I think that they solve different solutions. Uh, and uh, I do think that there are a lot of extra things that we can do with our ATEMs. The open architecture of the ATEM makes it a lot easier. And the fact that it's such a huge ecosystem, you know, there there are hundreds of thousands of, of ATEM users. And so, you know, the, the mini line kind of changed the size of that market pretty dramatically. And so the, um, so anyway, so that's the uh, I think that that's the advantage that Blackmagic has. Of course, Roland has the, the balanced audio. There's a lot of the T-bar, all those things. It's a nice little kit um, that makes that work. And so I, I think that both of them are really strong. There's times when I look at it and I go, oh, I really, that'd be really great. <laughs> you know, like that would be a really great little switcher. But we tend to lean back into the ATEM mostly because of software control. And John Wallace. Yeah, I think it's just serving two different markets like Alex was saving really the VJ market for the Roland stuff and then professional video. Uh, when it comes to black magic, I think both can, you know, solve and work in both situations. I really don't think that they're really targeting the same audience. I think one's targeting video people, the other one's talking, targeting audio people who need to do video in a situation. And I think that's really what you're seeing there. That's a solid point. Alex Knight. Yeah, so one one of the things that I'm running into now, of course, because uh, I've been podcasting for over 10 years, but I've had a bit of a hiatus in the last few years, and I've been producing other people's shows. But now that I'm developing a new show with a co-host of mine, I can kind of do it because I run the audio and I have to do all the camera switching. But it would be really, really nice if I could just have someone remotely cut the show but of course, the, the the Roland switcher that I have doesn't have that functionality. There's an iPad companion app, but that would mean I would have to figure out a way to somehow allow someone to get remote access into the iPad in order to actually cut the show. And as far as I know, with iOS, I don't think there's any kind of access at that sort of level. Yeah, I don't think there is. I, I think that's the problem, Is that, and that's why a lot of us use the ATEMs is because of the... The fact that we have so much access and and think again for a lot of us mix effect pro is part of what makes the atem so much more valuable than all the other switchers <laughs> it's because there's this piece of software that really takes full advantage of uh of what the switcher can do john i think the what you would need is someone who has their own ipad who could then vpn into your network to control that switcher so think of it that way either way with mix effects pro you know pro or this, you'd have to find a way to get to get them into your network. Thanks. Next question. James Fosley in Minneapolis, Minnesota, with looking for image stacking and alignment programs for focus and or HDR or panoramic purposes. I saw Hugin, which is open source. Are there any other recommendations? Alex? Yeah, a lot of these are different apps. <laughs> you know, so Hugin, uh, Hugin, I think it's Hugin. Oh, it's Hugin. Um, is, uh, is, um, that's a really well-known one and, and, and open source. And so you can make that work uh, for stitching panoramic purposes for both video or audio or, or stills. Um, there's also PT GUI, um, which is something you want to take a look at. For stacking focus, that can be done in Photoshop and to some degree HDR um, can be done in Photoshop as well. So Photoshop has a lot of that built into it. Panoramics can also be done in, in Photoshop, depending on whether you're trying to do 360 or just simple panos. Um, and then you also want to look at Skylum software makes Aurora, uh, which does an, an HDR compiling um, system as well. So those are a couple options um, to go down that path. Thanks. We're just a little halfway past our first hour. So producers, if you have any questions that you want to ask, go ahead and add them to the queue. Next question. Next one comes to us from Alex Knight in Vancouver, Canada. And Alex says, how is Mitchell getting side tone in his audio chain without an audio interface? It looks like his Aphex goes straight into his Mac, either through the digital or analog out. Go ahead, Mitchell. Well, the easy way to explain is show my uh, lower Fenwick there. Um, I'm using an, uh, Studio Technologies 205, which really makes this easy. Um, everything's ahead of the Aphex, as you can see on the, uh, the diagram there. Um, the 205 sends an analog uh, level up from the microphone, which is plugged directly into it, and that goes to the Aphex, but it also creates a Dante uh, instance, and that Dante can be uh, patched all over the place. So on the front of the uh, the 205, there's a nice little, it's hard to see them here, I'm sorry, but they're detented. 
Uh, there's volume controls. So over here, there's my side tone, and that's coming into me uh, via Dante. And then Zoom is here, and then Unity is here for our backend communication. So I can create a premix right here uh, that suits my hearing, and it's all done in this little 205. I just muted it. Uh, the mute button on it, I know it's expensive and I've gone crazy uh, with all this, but the 205 is a very uh, handy little device. I think Alex has one there too and um, works well, especially for the side tone. Next question. Next one comes to us from Roscoe Jones in Brea, California. Now that we are post-pandemic, what technology that came out in the last two years has most impacted you and what new technology will have the great uh, a great influence on everyone going forward? Let's start with Nigel. So I think Alex mentioned it earlier that the really black magic and the black magic stream deck connection has really changed the way that most of us have got into this business. And and black magic was around before, but they've changed the price point and the entry point for most of us, I think, very significantly. I think in terms of future technologies, I would expect that to continue. But I think the same level of simplicity in production could come to audio via a Dante or other technology that can almost consumerizes the way Blackmagic has done the video side. Go ahead, Alex. Lindsay. Yeah, I think that uh, I, the couple of things Blackmagic I agree with with Nigel is that it, it was these ATEMs were starting to come out before the pandemic but just the sheer mass of them that have come out and created an ecosystem is going to make a huge difference and has made a huge difference. The ISO is new to, to this, um, um, this time frame, and uh, it's extremely powerful. Also, I would say Zoom ISO and Zoom OSC and Zoom in, in general, the updates to Zoom. Uh, but Zoom ISO and Zoom OSC, I think we're gonna see continue to grow over the next two years uh, and over the next decade. Um, those types of technologies that allow us to using something like Zoom uh, and Zoom in this specific case, um, uh, I think we're going to end up with being able to build events and build connections between people that it's hard to imagine where we're at from where we're at right now. So it's like trying to say, well, I know you're on a horse and here's a car. And people are like, well, I could, I guess I could get to work with it, but they, they haven't, you know, they haven't seen everything else that's coming. So being able to really control and and access all the audio, video uh, feeds, and everything else um, completely uh, from you know from an external interface is going to make a massive difference in what we do. Go ahead, Courtney. I agree with Alex on the technologies as far as hardware goes. My uh, Rodecaster Pro Two is a great leap forward in uh, audio mixers for a reasonable price. Also, the DJI mics, a uh, digital microphone, a digital wireless mic with two transmitters and a single tiny receiver that also record in each of the transmitters, which has been pretty much unavailable for digital trans transmitters in the United States unless there's XCOM for the past several years. So that's a new improvement and uh, that moves us forward quite a bit in the quality of audio for YouTubers out there. Mitchell? Yeah, all of the above and the fact that uh, the, even though the ATAM was out before the pandemic and Zoom was out before the pandemic, the whole fact that uh, Blackmagic Design sort of tapped into that Zoom uh, zeitgeist and uh, allowed the two to work hand in hand to make what we're seeing right here. So um, I, I, I think that the pandemic sort of crystallized that and made that a thing because before that, I think the market was smaller for both those companies. And Tony. Yeah, I have to echo everything that's already been said. I, I, I do think that the impact of Zoom from the standpoint of the re regular everyday person has had the biggest impact on people in general. Uh, schools, just the, the common everyday person, Zoom has made a major impact in that. And I don't think there's any going back from that standpoint. I was primarily a Skype user uh, prior to, prior to um, this. Good point there, Bill. Yeah, I'm going to consolidate it down to a, a simple phrase, global Zoomification. I think everybody that I know, no matter where they are on the planet, is now using this technology we use every day in office hours. Not everybody and not all the time, but they are at least conversant with it. And before the pandemic, it was rare. We used to do Zoom calls into education systems. We had a product that we sold into schools. And so I had maybe done 15 Zoom calls before the pandemic. 
obviously with office hours, I've done multiple times that and become really comfortable with this technology, which I think is really enabling communities that were never possible before. This is a great example. And Alex? I also think just the interaction between a lot of these products that we're able to talk to each other is going to make a big difference when we think about the technology, not specifically a technology, but if you look at how this show gets done with a mixture of Isadora and Universe and Mix Effect Pro and ATEMS and and Zoom and Zoom ISO and Zoom OSC, you know, that kind of ecosystem of open architecture. I have to I have to admit that I, I don't I'm not necessarily looking for open source. But if I see hardware and software now that doesn't have hooks that we can get into to to do what we want to do, I just go, well, I can't do that. I can't use that. <laughs> like, like I can't, like I, you know, and I think that that's, that's something that's changed for me is that, you know, we, now I admit we invested heavily in Blackmagic for like five or six years because it had an open architecture, but we didn't take full advantage of it. Nowadays, I, I, I almost write off stuff that doesn't have an, some kind of a set of hooks and the more hooks they have externally, uh, the more likely we are going to add it to our ecosystem. I think it's become critical for c companies to think about. Next question. JJ McKenna in Santa Venetia, California says, are there any functional MIDI via Bluetooth apps for Android to control FL Studio Mobile from another device? Go ahead, Alex. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about Fruity Loops. And and if, if FL, uh, I am just getting started with it. And from what I've seen so far, I don't think there is. I don't think there's any way you're going to be able to do that. So, um, but I'm just uh, playing with it on the weekends. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Next question comes from Tony Mobley, our friend in Noonan, Georgia. Is it possible for a video production for profit business to get a grant? Go ahead, Alex. Liberty will probably be able to answer this more effectively. Uh, there's definitely grants out there that don't need, don't require nonprofit, um, but uh, but nonprofits generally get a lot of the grants that are out there. Yeah, exactly what Alex said. It pr primarily does, but go to nonprofits. But with the, if we go back to Roscoe's question of this post pandemic, there are so many organizations now that are out there that are looking to show that they're part of the social impact movement and, and companies, supporting companies that are doing good. So you can look at areas of what community are you serving, even as a for-profit business and you can find grants out there that will speak to that if you are doing STEM education, if you are doing things in social emotional learning, if you are helping a, a marginalized community. So yes, a for-profit organization can get a grant. Um, they're usually highly competitive. So just making sure that you dot your I's, cross your T's, um, show uh, what I'm finding is your ability to tell your story, but then also showing the impact that them investing in you because if you think about it a grant is them giving you money because they're looking for certain results so your ability to show that this number and if you can quantify it that's always better or if you can show some past traction in uh, with a project that you've done that always helps to really uh, fortify and, and strengthen your application next question Nick Bat in the UK says, what's the most useful thing you've bought recently to help you stream and or use Zoom and so forth? Go ahead, Mitchell. Without a doubt, Mix Effect Pro. It is a Swiss Army knife that incorporates so many of the ATEM functionality that you really just can't do without it, especially when you hook it up with a stream deck. And Alex. Uh, the thing that is the most recent that I'm excited to incorporate into my streaming are, is this little guy here. This is the Insta, Insta 360 uh, link. Um, this is a PTZ camera. <laughs> you know, so it's a tiny, tiny little PTZ camera. Um, and we've been testing it and the controls, the color, the re you know, the quality is the highest we've seen in a little web camera. So this is 300 bucks. Um, and uh, I'm planning, you know, the problem, the only downfall of it is it's just USB out. And so it's kind of hard to figure out exactly how we're going to incorporate it in to what we normally do. Um, but I can definitely see that for folks who do have a more web-based um, control, and I'm looking at using it as kind of a little overhead for, you know, some of the stuff I do in Keynote. So um, so those are the kind of things that I'm, that I'm playing with, but it's a pretty exciting little, I'm hoping that it's the first step. You know, we, we talked over the weekend, I think, over brainstorming what we want to see next, and our thing is if they went from a half inch to a full inch <laughs> sensor um, and, uh, and then gave us uh, HDMI out, we'd be, we'd be willing to pay for that. That's all we're saying. Go ahead, Bill. 
It's just about what I do. But honestly, the little Rolls mic mute is probably the single, I, I bought it a year and a half ago, two years ago, but it is the thing I use most often. And for me, this is individual to me, getting out of the Zoom interface mute process entirely and having a tactile control that my finger rests on to know when my mic is hot or not has been transformative to me. The studio technologies things will do the same thing, but I struggle mightily with the Zoom mute interface controls and I tried everything. None of them were consistent. This has been very consistent for me. How come it's not plugged in right now, Bill? That's my spare. I like it so much that this one that I just been tapping is on and this was in case that one fails. <laughs> redundancy, redundancy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Next question. Next question comes from James Fossiline in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Watch Light and Magic one time through to get the story. How do you watch a program to understand construction and technique? Go ahead, Alex. I pause a lot. <laughs> so, so you know, I, I, you know, a lot of it is construction. I will, re I will repeat a lot of things very, very slowly. Now, I will admit that um, I have a tendency to put things into formats that I can mani manipulate more effectively um, than than the Apple TV. <laughs> so, so, um, so I move move things generally out of the their their core format into something that I can use, and um, and so I. Uh, anyway, so, but I roll through it, break it down. Um, I, a lot of times I watch things, sections that I like or scenes that I like, I tend to watch without audio. It's very hard not to get caught up in the audio if you do it. So I will tend to like for movies that I really, really enjoy as an example, I will watch the movie, just enjoy it. Sometimes I'll watch it again if I really liked it. Then I'll turn off all the audio and literally watch the whole film. Like just, just watch visually what they did with the film. I can't get the visuals without turning off the audio, like everything that they did. Then I'll, then I, I literally, I mean, these are movies that this is like a, like the typically for me as a Christopher Nolan film, I'll tend to do the, this kind of operation with, because he's doing so many things that are better than what I would do. <laughs> so anyway, so, uh, and, but then I'll listen to it. I literally will just put a headphones on and just lay back and just listen to a movie and um and just listen to all the sound effects and all the all of what they did and if you take each piece then what's interesting is you come back to it and i don't do it all in one day or anything this might be over a week or two um if you come back to it you watch it again and now everything's there like you're conscious to all these things that are happening around it so if you really want to learn from a great film i, I suggest you know kind of breaking breaking that down and then thinking about what is you know what's act one what's act two, what's act three, you know, where is that cutoff? You know, act one typically ends somewhere between 40 and 40, 50 minutes in. So you just kind of like that's, you know, in act two typically ends somewhere between 125 and 135. Um, and so those are the, you know, so you can kind of usually find those, those things. You'll notice that something, notice in how many movies something dramatic happens between, there's a, there's a dramatic dramatic scene that will happen somewhere between 40 and 50 minutes <laughs> you know like it's and that's that's pushing you into the into act 2 go ahead bill um Interestingly enough, if you're fascinated with this, and I haven't checked with Alex to make sure, but one of the, his proposals, and we're going to do Thursday a breakdown on the show yeah. of Light and Magic in the second hour. So for those of you who are interested in this structure, you've triggered me to kind of pay a little more attention on the structure part of things. So tune in. And, and we're not going to watch the structure as much as what we're going to do is just look at a lot of the production techniques. The, the it, We don't have enough time to cover everything in that, but it, it is one of the best documentaries shot, you know, and so we're going to talk about the you know the different interviews uh the, the framing the formats the process also how they did the 3d animations which i thought were genius and um and some of the breakdowns and so we'll, we'll just cut through a couple of those so the way i typically do it is i like the your format though alice because i don't think i've necessarily turned it off and then allowed my mind to go through that so i'm gonna i'm gonna add that hack um to my list but it's, I very, it's very relaxing on a saturday afternoon just to listen to yeah. a movie you just sit there and and what you know it's 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 confusing if you haven't already seen the movie but you can right. listen to it and go oh i see what they did with that surround over here or they i don't if i see the film as stereo i won't listen to it but if i if i if it's a surround i'll, I'll typically put it on and listen to what they're doing in the in the side what i'm really listening for a lot of times is the surround speakers 
got it. I think I'd also just mentally tune it out because I'm like, how did they do that? So it's just, you know, you just zone right in. So I do a lot of the rewind and slow down. And and then if, uh, because sometimes I'm like on my laptop, I was like, no, I need to see this on the big screen. So I'll hook it up so I can watch it frame by frame. But I also go and see if there's any other commentary around it. So uh, whether it's be searching on Google or searching on YouTube to see, okay, like what else? And like, did I, did I get that right? What was their strategy um, behind doing that? So that's kind of just how I, I walk through it because it's always fascinating. And thank you. I'm looking forward to Thursday's <laughs> Thursday show. I think that behind the scenes and talking through that would be just a great even staple for us to do every now and then. So, next question. Next one comes from Khalid al and I hope I'm getting that close to right, in Hassa, Saudi Arabia. Has anyone tried Focus Puller, an iPhone app that uses the LiDAR to autofocus the Blackmagic cameras? And he has a couple of links there. Let's start with John. I've not used this directly, but I have seen some videos. It looks to become even more popular. Um, DJI uh, released a, a LiDAR um, that can also attach to a, a Focus Puller. Um, so definitely very interesting to see coming. Uh, the autofocus seems to work very well, at least for the videos I've seen. Um, it's all about how you calibrate it. Um, and obviously the lens um, is going to play a big part of that as well. But um, I, I've been really impressed. It's something I definitely want to try out. And Alex. And it looks like it, I, I think that if I read this right, and I didn't know that this even existed, this looks like it's actually, you know, talking via Bluetooth. So you don't need the motors or anything else. You're able to pull the focus with it. So I have um, installed it on a phone. I'm, try, I'm trying to get it figured out. I think I won't be able to figure it out during the show, but but wow, this looks really, I mean, if it works, it looks like it would be exceptionally useful, um, but it'll be hard to hard to know until it, until it, uh, until we get it on a, on a camera. So, but we've got cameras around. We'll start figuring out the test. Next question. Liberty White in Atlanta, Georgia says, I produced a LinkedIn audio event similar to Clubhouse last week, but there isn't a record feature yet. How can I record it for future podcast use? Yeah, so I know that um, like Clubhouse, we used to do the Clubhouse um, series last year, early last year, um, the Office Hours community. And I remember someone talking through like how to... Um, to record it. So I was just like, okay, got to ask this question. Go ahead, Bill. If you're getting both sides of the conversation on a headphone of any kind, if you're monitoring what you're saying, the simplest way is just use a headphone splitter and to take one piece out to any kind of recording devices, including a little hand recorder that you'd use at your desk. That will work. Now, sometimes when you split a signal like that, it will drop so low that you get uh, less than great quality audio. So uh, Little companies like Behringer make these really small little headphone amplifiers where you put the signal coming into it, and then you have volume control over the outputs on that. So if you need to boost it a little, you could use one of those. But it should be relatively trivial if you don't want to go to the uh, complexity of getting into loopback and one of the recording apps on your computer at the same time. Yeah, Tony had mentioned that to me, like possibly using loopback. Uh, I'm thinking... That, that is a possibility of what other, just having as many alternatives as possible. Go ahead, John. The Dante Avio, uh, they have a Bluetooth adapter. Uh, then you can get audio in and out. Uh, Alex is holding it up. So that <laughs> that is the easy way to trick any sort of device that doesn't want you to use professional audio gear, uh, kind of sending the audio both ways. Okay, awesome. Alex? This is the, yeah, this is the, um, is it, is it phone only? Is the LinkedIn phone only or is so it? So far from what I've seen, yeah. it's, it's phone only. So, so. Um, anyway, so um, this is the Dante Avio. This is a Bluetooth IO adapter. So if you have a Dante, if you have the ability to Dante, what you can do here is, is this is just Ethernet. You need power over Ethernet. So a PoE switch, okay. you plug this in and when you attach your, what, this is how I do Clubhouse is I attach my phone um, you know, I make this, I, this looks like a headset to the phone. So, so now what I do is I can record my own local audio to my mixer, if my, well, whatever I have that has Dante, right? So you have to have at least Dante virtual sound card on your computer. Okay. And then you're recording your local, but you'll record the other side of the, will come in via this because it's, it's going to be isolated. It's not going to have you in it. So it's going to come to you as separate. And now, <clears throat> now you have both sides you know, of, okay. of that of that process. And so so that can be if, if you're stuck with the phone, I, I, I find this phone limitation thing to be super annoying 
But this is one way to do it. Another way to do it, JK Audio makes a whole host of tools that are designed to deal with phones. So how do you call into something and, and deliver it out as XLR or whatever else you want, Bluetooth? It, JK Audio has nearly every solution you can possibly imagine for tying a phone into a production system. Um, so that can be another way to do it. Obviously, once you get into, if, if you're able to uh, get to that call, another thing to remember is, yeah, if you're able to get to the call with, something else. Now, like for instance, you might be able to use your phone as um, a, a phone for your computer. Now you have that into, you know, you're calling out of FaceTime or whatever, or calling out, you can call out from your computer once you do that. That's another way to, to manage that. And then you're, you're, but again, you're back to loop back and, and uh, right. potentially audio hijack, um, which is uh, something that's good. But if you can get back to a point where you can use a computer, now you have the isolated inputs and outputs. Copy that. And Mitchell. Yeah, a couple other ways to uh, get your phones into uh, that type of situation. Uh, the Rode Broadcaster 2, which Courtney has there, has the ability to do that. And the Angry Audio uh, Bluetooth uh, device that uh, does everything for the uh, phone callers, including the Mix Minus going back to the caller. Next question. Alex Knight in Vancouver, Canada says, why do ATEM minis have so many buttons? Doesn't anyone, uh, does anyone use even half of those? Seems like a strange design choice. Alex? So many buttons. I will agree with you. I, I use the, some of the big buttons and a handful of little ones. But when I talk to people, different people are using different sets of the buttons. So none of us use all the buttons, but all of us use some of the buttons. And so it would be hard to figure out which ones. And it does mean that you can really operate a whole show. Uh, with a lot of controls over it from the from the ATEM, you wouldn't need the software. But because so many people here use the software, it becomes uh, less less useful for us. Mitchell, real quick. I use, I use all the buttons. Uh, the heat that it generates keeps my ham sandwich warm for lunchtime. Courtney. I use a lot of the buttons. I like the ability to, to just bump the sound up or down a little bit if I'm using the sound, any of the sound inputs. Um, the other thing is I wish the buttons did is I wish they were settable. For example, the DVE buttons that do the, uh, you know, window in the corner, et cetera. But it's a preset size and you can't change it. And every time you load it or save it, it goes back to the original. So I'd, I'd appreciate it more if they had uh, more control over what the buttons did so that you could save their settings and adjust them from the factory defaults. The macro buttons are probably the most valuable buttons, but they only appear on the extreme and not on the ISO, many ISO, which is what I had. And Nigel. Somewhere a product manager did some usage scenarios and there was a group of users who wanted buttons. And until they've been proved to be wrong, they will put buttons. <laughs> Good call, Nigel. Next question. Next one comes to us from Alec McPherson and Georgina. Uh, Liberty, I noticed you have been experimenting with audio streams on LinkedIn. Could you share your process and what you've learned so far? Yes, great question, Alan. I that wasn't the first one, so it was it was it went well. I would say. Um, there were a few office hours folks on there, which was really helpful. It's really intuitive. So just coming on and then pulling the host on and off. Since it's a new feature, I think that, I'm sorry, the, the guest speakers, I think that they're, if you're going to do something like that, that you would definitely want to just prep them so that they have a very fluid experience. Um, and then just even the one thing that I would say that could be improved is there's not necessarily like a chat feature or a commenting feature. So you have people that are in the audience. And I guess the idea is that they essentially want people to come on stage and interact, but there's still people who won't don't necessarily want to do that. They just purely want to listen and engage in the chat. Um, what we did was when you do a audio event, there's a post and there were some people com just commenting on that post. And that's what chat, that's where the chat came into place. So I'll continue to report back, but so far it's simple, intuitive, and I can see the power of you just being connected to the LinkedIn network and people just connecting with others. So I see the value there. Um, Alex? Yeah, the, the lack of being able to put in text questions and comments is a disastrous design flaw. Yeah. Like you just having people have forcing people to come on stage and you shouldn't even have open mics in real in the real world, let alone um, forcing people to do it in audio. It's just a disaster. Next question. 
Alex Knight in Vancouver, Canada says, what does anyone know of a DIY do-it-yourself kit to build your own on-air light? I'd like one, but many pre-made ones are expensive. My Roland switcher has an RS-232 port that I can perhaps use to turn it on. Alex? Uh, yeah, the... Um, uh, yeah, the on the on air light. I mean, remember that a, a two thirty two means you can control anything, so you can definitely build a switch to make anything work. <laughs> so you don't need to have uh, something that's specific to talk to it. Mitchell, I would expand your search to tally lights because tally lights essentially could do the same thing. When you have that camera on or mic on, um, you could probably control it much the same way. The light over my head over here is an expensive, not build your own. Uh, uh, on air light that uh, can turn on and off. This one right here uh, is available as a kit. It's about 35 bucks and it's neon, which is kind of neat. The neon part, and it's in a plastic case with a power supply and other things like that. So um, you can have fun with that. And it's pretty cheap. If you had to go out and buy the parts for it, you'd spend more money than what the kit would be. And Courtney. Uh, yeah, if you really like the DIY stuff and you have a 3D printer, you can look at Adafruit has one. Uh, print your own a 3D printed IoT on air uh, light and switch for Twitch. Uh, so, uh, and Adafruit is is pretty good. I think this is about sixteen, seventeen dollars. Is that what it says? Yeah, uh, it requires a, a feather or something to control it. No, maybe it's a little more than that, but uh, that's one way if you have a 3D printer. Wonderful. Well, thank you to our producers for all those great questions for our first hour. Now we're heading into our second hour where we're going to speak about visual visual communications. What is that? What does that mean? How will that impact your brand? If you're a nonprofit, definitely stay tuned and go ahead and enter your questions now so that we can um, get to them once we finish speaking with Christopher Jones. Thank you so much, Christopher, for being here today. And you're on Thank mute. You so there we go. So, Christopher, I invited you here because uh, one, I've known you for a really long time and just your work in the 2D, 3D space artistically um, as a creative, but then also that you work in the nonprofit space, not only volunteering, but then also being the visual communications manager at Chris 180. Um, and you have really worked towards helping like they do phenomenal work but then also just the with the communications team that you have all been evolving the brand and a lot of the marketing pieces that you put out there and i thought that it would be a great opportunity to actually speak through like how you go through that process our community there are a lot of us are working in production there are designers as well in so many different spaces but to really understand what that process looks like so i guess i will start with letting you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background Sure. Well, good morning again. Uh, Christopher Jones, Digital Communications Manager at Atlanta-based nonprofit Chris 180. Um, outside of that organization, I also have my own design practice called C. Jones Creative that I've been um, running since 2013. Um, I, um, my background is in graphic design, marketing, communications, um, and I have been with my current organization for about three years. Um, I came into the um, nonprofit space um, many, many years prior to that. But the current organization I am uh, had been in at had undergone a brand um, refresh um, in 2016 and was building out a new um, a new a new marketing wing. Um, I was brought on by the chief marketing or marketing. Um, officer and was the first hire on that team and so we had the unique challenge of taking um, a nonprofit that had so that had so many different programs um, that we offer to the community and making that uh, cohesive bringing everybody together it's not only do we have a number of programs but there are also a lot of different pieces that we had to connect the dots to visually and so I hope um, 
during our conversation, I can kind of leave you with a few tidbits of how if you are working with a nonprofit, you can kind of build some cohesiveness in in your brand or or in others that you may be working with. Um, because it's often said that um, branding is what people say about you when you're not in the room. So those um, visual components can be important. And so tell us a little bit more about once you actually decide, like, so what does a project actually look like when you're looking at, where do you start with your visual communications? Is it, is there a certain area of like, is it starting with the messaging or start, if you kind of talk us through that? Sure. Um, definitely you want to be sure that you have all the stakeholders in the room or in the in the conversation because you're not only communicating with your your customers or your your donors you may also be communicating with if you have staff people uh, other people that will be impacted by whatever it is that you're creating so it definitely starts um outside of the outside of the visuals first having all of the stakeholders in place and then coming up with a project plan um, you got to know who you're who you're speaking to. What is the audience? What is the the intended impact? And then, um, so you want to think about what, how do we want to be seen or or um, or received by this audience? So that would influence the before you get even get to the look. You have to think about who who those people are and what what you want your objectives to be. And that would influence everything from your colors to, because certain colors have different connotations. Um, um, red can make you make you feel hot. Um, the blue might make you feel cold. So think about those thoughts and feelings that you want to convey. Um, also, you want to, another element to think about is that trust builds consistency. So you want to be sure that you're using the same graphic elements throughout all of your different um, marketing materials because you don't want to look like two different, two or three different organizations with every communications piece that you put out there. And so that goes into um, building um, what's normally referred to as a, a style guide or branding guidelines. Um, I was um, one of the major projects in my current role, it was to helping to establish and roll out uh, organizations brand and brand standards and guidelines. And this document is pretty much used as the Bible, the visual Bible throughout the organization so that we're able to provide any vendors that do any contract creative work with us. They have the same information so that they can create um, the, they can create materials that that have the same look and so that we have that consistency still have the same trust that we are and integrity that we are looking to build throughout all of our communications uh, materials you made a comment about having consistency in in graphics and yeah. what is that the way a certain photos look is that logos like so often when people thought, think about just brand, it's it's like the logo and it's much more than that. Can you add a little bit more context to what elements and what you mean by what those graphics look like so that for the consistency sake? Sure, sure. So a lot of people think when they hear about, about branding and they think about it's just the logo, but actually a logo purpose is to serve as an identifier for the organization. It doesn't necessarily have to be to tell you everything that that organization does. The main purpose for a logo is to create something that will be memorable as a symbol or a mark for the organization. And then you go from there to figure out, to learn the rest of it. But a brand is, is much more than just a logo. It's a combination of all the different touch points that a an individual has when they come in contact with your brand is what they hear is what they feel what they might even smell or experience when your organization's name comes into conversation um think about it if you if you 
your brand is listed in a store aisle with a bunch of other different brands. What is it about your brand that is going to stand out on that shelf to make um, someone to pull your your box of cereal down um, regardless of the others? It's those memories that you're able to create when people interact with you at your community events. It's um, how it feels um, when you pick up the different swag items or giveaways. Um, if you are a service organization, people are going to remember how they were treated when they walk into the front door and engage with you. And so all of those different touch points come, in, come into um, thought and uh, consideration when, when um, someone interacts with your brand. So you have to keep that in mind. It goes beyond the visuals. It's the entire experience that a person has. So I think as an advice to those who may, be, may have a brand or be working towards one, think about the entire um, ceremony of someone interacting with it and ask yourself, if, am I creating a consistent experience across the board or are there things that I can tailor and tool so that people recognize me in the way that I want to be seen at all times. Mm, that's that's really good. Then going on the, the other side, what are some of the biz- biggest mistakes that you find people make when it comes to this holistic view of of their their brand the, and especially leaning towards the, the visual side of things? Uh, I think one of the... Um, kind of his mistakes or kind of a, a short-sighted um, step may be to invest all of the time into the logo. While it is an important mark or asset for your organization, you definitely want it to represent excellence, um, represent your brand in a certain way. Um, I've seen people that will go through um, a logo project and put it out there and say, hey, look at my brand's new logo. But then they haven't thought through to of how that logo is going to be applied across the other marketing materials. So you probably have your website, your business card, and you spend all this time on the logo, but you haven't applied this to the other elements. And so while you have, yes, you refresh your logo, the rest of your brand still looks dated or in the old way that you were trying to overcome. So I would say don't rush to, to um, if you're going through a rebrand, don't rush to put out that one element. Take the time to see how the application is going to be across those other materials and then introduce your brand because that is going to be have a more um, holistic view um, it shows the total package. And so you want to think through all of those things before you rush to put it out there. That makes sense. And then corporate nonprofit, when it comes to this holistic experience, is there is there a difference? Is there something that nonprofits should be paying more attention to, or is it still the same the same process in your opinion? I'd say it's very much, very much the same process. Um, I'd say with working with a nonprofit, however, um, you are likely to be working with limited resources. Um, but that can be, that doesn't necessarily have to be a limit. Um, there um, may be, there may be um, resources out there because of your nonprofit status that are available to you, um, certain tools um, um, such as um, Canva may have a, if you're, that is a creative tool that your, your marketing team uses, that they have a nonprofit pricing. So that could be somewhat of an advantage. Um, you probably are going to have a smaller team working on your brand. So that means that you're probably going to be wearing a lot of different hats. And when you're trying to do a lot of different task at the same time, um, your attention is going to be be um, limited as to how much you're able to do um, in a certain amount of time. So I would say in a larger organization, a more corporate environment, you have larger teams and those teams have 
individuals who are tasked with taking on those smaller tasks. So you might have someone doing the social media aspect or specifically social graphics. Someone working on the web, you may have a developer, um, you may have copywriters. Um, in my experience in working in nonprofits, a lot of those tasks have been have fallen on me as one person. And so you have to kind of learn how to um, work a little smarter, <laughs> not harder, um, and do what you can during that time and keeping those objectives in mind. Because there's we all have the same number of hours in the day. And so there's going to be some opportunity costs in deciding what you can actually focus on. So I say, I say the major difference in, in um, corporate work and nonprofit work is just that the corporate environment is going to have more access to resources and um, manpower. Okay, let's dive into these questions, Bill. Our first one comes from David Brady in New York City. And David says, at the Sunday place, everyone involved uses their own Gmail accounts. Looking to propose moving to Google for nonprofits, are there any pros or cons to this? And are other platforms, are there other platforms to consider for the whole enchilada, space, Gmail, uh, email, and so forth? Go ahead, John. Yeah, so... Um, I, I don't know that that specific product, the nonprofit product, but Gmail is the best mail on the planet. And now that they're charging, I don't, I don't know what they give you. They give you some discount for nonprofit, but it's the best email on the planet, David. Next question. Uh, Daniel Goldstein is up next. He says, do you have any suggestions for media production folks to cooperate and work with branding, PR, social media folks to get them to meet the same high standards for video that we hold ourselves to? All right, Chris, any thoughts there? I'd say that having that brand standards and guidelines document can be very helpful because that gives you a documented source of stating that these are what our standards are this is what we expect and it helps you present your your division or your your department in a in a light to so that they know that they're going to need to meet these expectations in order to do business with you and it, this tool we've used it and in, in my organization has been very helpful we've um, had some very high caliber um, video production artists um, in and that's kind of a bit instrumental and helpful in, in our process. Thanks for that, Chris. And I would also add that having that that conversation with with the the stakeholders on those teams up front. Uh, I don't know at what point as as early as you come on board in the in the project or in the event to really show them how it's going to impact like having some of those other teams how what they do impacts the overall idea of what what is going to take place and how that impacts the brand because everyone hopefully <laughs> is looking towards how you know the same goal of of excellence and by really com communicating the the pros and cons so if we don't get this on time or if this has a certain look or feel how that is ultimately going to impact the production. Um, really just having conversations, showing examples whenever possible, and just also making sure that you are speaking to someone who um, can make the decision. So say if you're speaking to someone on the social media team, maybe it's a conversation with a social media manager or the PR manager so that then they can really help give that, that push to the rest of the team. Bill? Also, since I worked with brand books for a lot of time in advertising, I've seen the development of them. In the early days, we used to get them, and they were predominantly for print communication. Maybe if we were lucky, that brand guides extended into uh, some other than print things, like maybe a little media or whatever. In this landscape today, you have so many different possibilities. There are so many digital uh, outputs that refreshing and making sure that your brand guides and the, the fact that you are communicating with your people how to use your logo for consistency across you know Twitter and TikTok and everything out there because there's just so many different possibilities and if you don't specify those that's been my experience anyway you you I see people diverting from the brand guides when they run into a circumstance that's not addressed in the brand guide and sometimes they make 
pretty bad decisions about, oh, I think I'll just take the logo and, and reverse it and put it over here and, and everything falls apart. They're trying to do the job they can, but nobody's communicating to them how to do that job. Next question. Uh, moving on, Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. One of the nonprofits I work with is Rotary. They have a great grant, brand resources, but the annual theme has its own logo and guidelines that's supposed to be internal facing. How would you approach this when your task is social media not differentiating audiences? Mm, Chris, what are your Christopher? What are your thoughts there? That is an interesting scenario. Um, I would say if the if the um, campaign is internal facing, then that um, we kind of question why why that's communicated out on social media because that is typically um, a platform for your external audiences. Um, definitely, I would suggest kind of leading with the with the think about who the stakeholders are, who is the target audience, who needs to be seeing these these elements, and but I think if I were taking it on, I would um, would definitely um, channel that out from the, the parent um, social media um, platform rather than creating a, a new one from scratch because you're going to have a limited audience, first of all. And um, the internal, the, the audience may not be familiar with this internal campaign. So you've got to introduce it some type of way so that it's clear that this is not a this is some, something that we're doing and not a competing entity. Nigel, your thoughts? I, I think Menari might be a good example of this. You end up in some politics if you're not careful here. So the the head of Rotary International changes every year. Everyone has their own theme. Each person who has their own theme wants their own logo. And particularly in nonprofits, it can be very hard to manage that because the identity of that annual leader is very wrapped up in the programs that they produce. And so if that's the scenario, the best thing we found is to try and make sure that the master brand and the sub brands are really well articulated and then try and find your way into a conversation where you try and help them. But you're not going to win some of those battles because they're just politics. That's an excellent point to put there, the, the politics part of it. John? Agree with the gentleman from Austin. A little backstory. My brother's a district governor in Rotary, and the incoming president owns her own marketing PR firm. And so she's pretty well off in this regard. And Imagine Rotary is, is the brand that she's pushing for her presidentship. Okay. And... I just when um, Nigel shared that of the politics side of things, I just remember um, stepping into the role when I was working at the state on the interactive team. And with so many different verticals, you've got the tourism team, you've got the global team, you've got different subsets. And yes, there are so many different people that are in charge of that vertical and then having to um, what you've got to do, hopefully just, I don't know where you are in the chain, if there is um, someone else that can kind of cast a vision of, okay, we need to pull these in. So if there is a, a director, senior director, and, or even the co communications team saying, okay, we're going to do this, this shift or this rebrand, and we're trying to get all of these teams to be a little bit more cohesive. That way it's not singling out one team in particular but or or one vertical but then having this uniform conversation so then that way you know the end game is okay <laughs> we want to be more co cohesive so that political play uh definitely is 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 something outside well something that is very much so also a part of just the creative process as well next question Brody Hafner in New York City has this one. For a photographer's archive focused on the historical and educational aspects of the collection, and this is for a nonprofit, how can we differentiate it from the multitude of for profit photography archives that are out there? What are your thoughts, Christopher? So you are trying to differentiate a photography archive from the the rest 
Is that yeah, true? yeah. As a so as a nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. the the photography archive of a nonprofit group versus mm -hmm. as he um, as he shares the all the other ones that are out there that are for profit groups. Hmm. I would probably suggest promoting the uh, the philanthropic aspects of of the photography group, um, so that people, especially if you are um, or uh, soliciting donors, um, so that people can understand how how giving to the the nonprofit helps, how how it benefits the world, and I think that's one way that you could probably differentiate from the the for profit groups out there. Yeah. So what is the impact you're creating by by um, joining or being a part of this? The storytelling essentially is what you're saying, Christopher. Correct. Yes, definitely. The story so. And then bringing in um, the comments here, Chris Widener says that metadata, metadata and SEO um, will also be helpful there. So just those those words that you use can give you a competitive edge once you do the research and finding out what keywords um, you can rank um, higher for. That would be helpful. And then also just your um, with the storytelling the strategy of just getting that messaging out there could give you a a good competitive edge. Next question. And this is what I asked when I found out you were going to be here. In the last two or three years, are there any major changes you've seen relative to the deliverables you're asked to produce? Basically, what's new in the quiet requests that you're seeing nowadays versus the older time in your career? Christopher? I say definitely we are in the age where where video is is um, at a higher demand. Um, over the past two years, um, especially um, in the nonprofit space, um, we're communicators, um, marketers were faced with the challenge of how do we continue to get out the word about our our work to our constituents and our, our clients, our donors, um, all of our stakeholders, and one of the ways that. Um, I was um, involved in was um, we launched in um, a weekly web series um, during over the course of the pandemic where we brought in um, various experts um, from across our organization to to share um, share tips of um, with people on how on how to cope um, um, physically and mentally and um, just be well during during that time and it has. It still continues to this day, albeit on a, a less frequent schedule. But um, definitely, there's been a demand for for video content. Um, the algorithms for the different platforms continue to to change. Um, and if you in the social media world, um, it's very much kind of pay to play. So if you are not um, using paid ads, um, you've got to have a a way to kind of break through those. Um, algorithmic um, limitations. Um, so video um, is, I don't, I think it's here to stay. Um, reels um, on social media are, are more and more prevalent. And um, I say LinkedIn is probably an area that has some opportunity because it isn't bound by the same algorithms as um, platforms such as um, Facebook and Instagram. Next question. Alex Knight in Vancouver, Canada is up next. And Alex says the process of rebranding can have both positive and negative effects. How do you approach something like changing an iconic logo for an organization? And how do you mitigate public backlash? Ooh, I'm looking forward to this one, Christopher, your thoughts. I'd say that you definitely want to be sure to engage stakeholders, both old and new, because you don't want to alienate the old stakeholders because um, if it's an icon, if it's considered an iconic brand, there's probably some type of um, there's some nostalgia there that those that has drawn those people to to it, and so you want to un understand what what it is that is is drawing those drawing and and, and been keeping those people. Um, you also need to understand what what the future vision is for the organization. So I'd say that uh, possible, a good approach would probably be to bring in kind of a focus group of those old and new and, and kind of get their perspective so that you can figure out a way of how to move forward together. Ultimately, the, 
the the marketing and branding team is going to have final say. But I think getting that input at the beginning of the process could be could fare well in the end because you have an informed approach of how to how to do it rather than just lifting the <laughs> wool over people's uh, eyes and uh, surprising them. And I'll add too to that of the to be able to mitigate backlashes, just be prepared and, and knowing there's going to be a backlash because we it, it, there's loyalty and and people like the way, you know, and I'm making this up, but they like the way the Coca-Cola logo looks. And then when they was it the the Coke Zero, um, there was something uh, over a decade ago or so. And, and New brands. Coke. Thank you. Thank you. And then they're like, no, we we don't like that. No, we're going backwards even more recently with I mean, this is a little bit more technical in nature, but with Instagram saying, you know, we're pushing heavily on video. And then the Kardashians said, we just want to click and like our friends photos. And they they backpedaled to that. So it's it's just being prepared, knowing that there's loyalty. People uh, don't necessarily like change. So just being prepared for that and or trying to drip drip it out if possible take us on, on the journey with you next question chris clark in tempe arizona has this one how important is it to remind your clients that branding is a connection to your reputation so concentrating on reputation enhancement is a key to brand value go ahead christopher i i think that is is highly important um i think that's Something that you have to keep in mind throughout all of the different activities that you and projects that you might be undertaking with that client. Um, is, um, as you live these folks to, um, people are naturally resistant to change at times. Um, if you're introducing them to new practices or, or um, methods that they have not seen before, there could be some pushback. So keeping the objective of what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do at the forefront, I think can help to, to bridge that bridge and maintain that relationship between yourself and your clients. Thank you. And to our producers, this is a great time to add any additional questions that you have around branding and the visual communications process. And even if you are not a nonprofit, just your general questions, um, I'm sure Christopher and the panel will be happy to respond to them. Next question. Next one comes from Roscoe Jones in Brea, California. And Roscoe says, do you have any strategies to sell new branding ideas to nonprofit boards and or any success stories in this area? Go ahead, Christopher. Strategies for selling new branding ideas to nonprofit boards. That, that is a, that can be a very, uh, intense undertaking, um, but I believe that there are ways to go into it um, so that you are prepared and that also you have uh, an opt optimal uh, reception from, from the brand, from the board. Um, I'd say definitely know who on the board and know um, so that you know how to sell it to because this boards are, boards consist of people and those individuals have their own preferences. They come from various or various organizations and companies throughout that community that they represent. And so they're going to bring those into their um, decision making process. And so I'd say first research who's on the board and learn kind of what has been their track record as far as making decisions for the brand and include that in your presentation. So that you know how to tailor it to the people that you are um, that you're communicating with. Um, I think that's the number one, knowing who your audience is and that way you can tailor the presentation to what their their tastes are and hopefully you can strike a chord, um, whether that be emotionally or, or or rationally, so that they will be receptive to what it is that you're trying to to say. And any success stories in in that? And it could be even because when you're selling it to the board, that could also be like your team selling it internally as well to the board. If there are any success stories or stories that you want to share with us in that? I would say um, I guess success stories would be um, 
in in a, as in my, in my current role, we, my my team we due to our success kind of within our first couple of years, we had the opportunity to um, to build out the um, basically design a campaign for the organization's 40th anniversary. And because of we were able to kind of cultivate those relationships over the the previous year, they trusted us to make decisions as creating a an emblem for that um, that year long celebration, and things were easier to kind of get pushed through because of the previous year's track record that we were able to build. And so, kind of developing those relationships. Um, I mean, there may be a, a need for you to have outside meetings or to kind of build some one on one relationships, so that you can kind of have some coalition building with uh, with uh, those individuals. I'd say. It's a rewarding feeling to kind of get buy in for something, especially if you're taking an organization somewhere that it has not been before. Um, you want them to trust that you're capable of being able to drive it. And when, once you kind of have that, it is a it's a it's a sacred trust, but it's also a rewarding experience to, to be able to be trusted to to guide and to take take the organization to the next level. Yeah, definitely. Bill? I work mostly with for-profit boards, but there are a few nonprofits I worked with over the years. And I'm, I'm pretty firmly convinced that as great as the people on boards of directors can be, and there are a lot of fabulous people working on them, not all of them can visualize from one pitch mode what something is going to look like. And so we have really moved pretty heavily into comping stuff for them. Uh, we've built a system where we can comp video ideas together using people that we know. Sometimes it's um, obviously this is Greek, then it's not a final. But if you can make a compelling visual presentation and show them what you're thinking of doing, the buy-in rate we get jumps by leaps and bounds. Uh, a presentation on paper may close at a rate of 10 or 15 percent of the time. When we actually pre-produce comp video that looks similar to that, if we use their logo, their color schemes, if we use high quality clip video that really tells the story we're trying to tell, we go up into the 80 and 90 percent closure rates. I mean, people just can't imagine what it's going to be, but if they can see it, suddenly, yes, I would like something like this for us with just these changes. It's an incredibly powerful tool. Yeah, and, and that was uh, great just even sharing that of the, the visual aspect of making sure like sometimes and, and it's how much you want to invest into the relationship as well. So by you putting that together, then being able to, you know, you're already doing something up front for them that helps to build relationship. But then also going back to what Christopher said of the the need or the importance, like not to undervalue the importance of building that relationship up front. Um, and a few years ago, there was a, a, a national nonprofit that we were working it with, but it took like a few months because and also recognizing nonprofits move a little bit slower. So just setting your expectation in, you're not just necessarily going to just walk through the door. Um, and, but then also, is there someone, another vendor that you might know that works with the nonprofit where then you possibly come in working with that vendor? So now they already see, they get to know you, know, like trust, and you get to work on some some projects, projects with them. And that then helping to walk you through the door where, of course, just making sure that <laughs> your relationship with that with that vendor, um, that you just respect that relationship. But there could be some ways that you can walk through the door um, from from that vantage point that could be helpful as well. Next question. Brody Hefner in New York City is back again. He says, our photography-based nonprofit has a large and growing base of Facebook followers, about 35,000 of them, skewed to baby boomers. How can we enhance the brand to appeal to, appeal to younger audiences? Go ahead, Christopher. I would say that um, if your goal is to appeal to younger audiences, um, you may not find them on Facebook. Um, simply because they're not there. Um, so I think you um, may need to explore other platforms um, and go to where go to where your audience is. Um, 
Facebook kind of skew, skews older. Um, I mean, probably your older millennials um, and up. And so maybe look and see what might make sense for um, for your younger younger audiences. Probably Instagram is probably going to be more likely to be uh, something that um, younger audiences may may um, tap into, um, especially since it's a visual platform. So I would start there. And then also thinking, Christopher had said earlier in um, in the show of the brand, looking at it from a holistic perspective. And now while you're sharing that your Facebook community skews baby boomers, but what is that reflective of the overall brand so that it over, it skews um, towards baby, baby boomers overall? Because then that's when you're looking at a, a longer game. Are you possibly, is there a way to bring in um, some younger photographers and start showcasing some work from younger photographers to kind of help with the, so being just very intentional in who you spotlighted, where they are, um, looking at platforms like TikTok and, or do you start a, a series or a campaign where you're pairing maybe younger photographers and I'm just kind of the brain dumping at the same time, but it's not just looking at the platform because if you're looking at what the brand looks like overall, this is something that you'll, you're looking to, to seed uh, change and transformation. That's not going to happen overnight. So you're looking at, you know, some years of putting in some some groundwork. I'll uh, as an, an example, the Atlanta Metro Chamber of Commerce over the past seven or eight years, like this was an organization that younger businesses like my myself, that it was okay, that's just the Chamber of Commerce, but they recognize the shift in the the demographics in the city. So they started to partner, they started showing up at some of the startup events. They started, um, they now sponsor trips to um, to South by Southwest. So showing up where the audience is that you're looking to to help make that transformation. So it's not just the digital or the, the, the social media play, but where else can you um, can you pull in and like go where the audience is that you're trying to um, you're trying to change. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I, I agree with you. TikTok may be the platform to shoot for or do a create a challenge or something for the the people. If it, if you create a photography challenge to, you know, generate a unique type of photograph or a unique type of video, uh, if that goes viral, then you, you got it made. You got all the kids. And then you also want to be mindful that now the the balance of you possibly creating more content or trying to bring in this younger audience that you don't lose what you're already doing with your existing audience because you don't want them to feel in any ways that you're trying to, you know, kick them to the curve. So it's being intentional, being very thoughtful in, in how you make those, uh, take those next steps. Next question. Next one comes to us from Liberty White. What nonprofits get branding right? Who's doing it well? And if so, how are they doing it well? Christopher. Your thoughts? Oh goodness! <laughs> oh. Of course, Chris One Hundred and Eighty is on that list. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, it's been, been a definite labor of labor of love to, to work with the organization that I work for. Um, I also um, I previously worked with uh, United Way of Greater Atlanta, which is part of the global United Way organization, and it was great to kind of see how there are kind of global brand standards even though the on the local level the organization is kind of take, taking those brand standards and, and modified it for the audience because um as you, you and i both know atlanta is a, is a unique place so that might but there was a, a blueprint for us to follow um, in that that um that space so those are those are two that uh, i I'm, I'm gonna throw out there Next question. Next question comes to us from Chris Clark again in Tempe, Arizona. That McDonald's closed all of its stores in Russia. How do you think this might have affected their brand worldwide and in the USA? What do you think, Christopher? Can you repeat the question, please. Go ahead, Bill. 
The question was, McDonald's closed all its stores in Russia. How do you think this might have affected their brand worldwide and in the USA? Hmm. I was not aware that um, McDonald's had, had closed all those stores in Russia. I think McDonald's, um, as, a, as a global brand, it's so large that those outside of Russia may not may not feel that impact, but definitely um, if they were to combat or seek to combat, they're going to have to kind of have some kind of lower level um, weight, lower level weight to kind of uh, re-engage people. Um, I don't think that their brand awareness is going going to to leave uh, suddenly. However, they've got to if they plan to ever go back, they've got to kind of basically build some more pro- promotion to let people know that, hey, we're here. But I feel like McDonald's brand is so strong um, globally that um, the effects are probably not not felt as much. Um, it kind of goes um, into um, your um, Kind of your laws of a uh, substitution. So if people aren't going to McDonald's, they've probably got another brand that they are, are probably going to to kind of feel that that urge for for hunger. So they if they come back, they've probably got another uh, some competition that they're going to have to to grapple with. And that's go ahead, Bill. Yeah, that was a pretty bold move on their part, and it was you know at the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, I, I would imagine they took some time. In fact, a, a couple of interesting stories have been written about this. And uh, th- there was one that just crossed my eyes about three or four days ago about the five uh, aspects of corporate consideration they took into consideration when they made that decision to pull their brand entirely. And they literally took down McDonald's signs from all of their stores. And they had a pretty big presence in Russia and uh, let somebody else come in and rebrand everything. And they're having nothing to do with it. We are seeing more and more of these things where social uh, conscience, whatever direction you think that is, it's having an impact and brands are having to pick a side. In this particular case, McDonald's clearly looked at the global landscape of their business and said, first of all, our operations are being disrupted in one country, the Ukraine, where they had a big presence, and we've had to shut all of our cl- out of our stores down there. And they made some pretty bold decisions for a corporation to keep all of their people on salary Even though all the stores were shut down, and it's been many, many, many weeks now, and they're just beginning to open things back up, but they made this decision. We're going to uh, make corporate decisions on the side of Ukraine and not on the side of Russia, and we're going to pull our brand out of Russia. It was a big and bold move, but they felt that was the best thing to do to support the McDonald's brand uh, worldwide. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out, but they made a pretty bold move there. Yeah, and the brand and brand being what people say about you with McDonald's being, you know, this happy place and and this organized company that we've known for so long, they're also putting a stake in the ground of, well, here's our moral compass. Now that could be said on, we won't go <laughs> there with uh, other ways that, that they could improve, but them making that decision kind of speaks also to their, um, their identity and what their internally, what they represent. And if that being like Russia being one country, but then what this looks like, from a global perspective, they, they probably put a lot of thought into that. And, and that's why they made that move for, for the longer game. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, it's just it was interesting to me is that they weren't allowed not to make a decision and pick a side there. And, you know, often you, you hear about corporate governance and they say, well, let's try not to offend anybody. I think in this global communications environment, there are fewer and fewer opportunities you have to offend nobody. So you at least have to have a decision making process in place to to assess the positive and negative consequences of decisions you make in these kinds of areas. And if you don't have a place you know, something in place already, then you're going to be flailing a little if a conflict like this comes up and it affects your products. Very true. Courtney? Yeah, it was a bold move and they had to be willing to give up that portion of their market, perhaps forever. Uh, it, it makes a political, making a political statement is can be dangerous for a corporation. 
they had to make that decision on the danger of that and, and whether how it would affect their brand for uh, the future. It is a way in the situation that they're in now to cut through the some of the propaganda because the people of Russia will be wondering why all the McDonald's suddenly closed and the government uh, may not be giving them an accurate answer and they may be able to seek an answer elsewhere. So they may be using that uh, a method to cut through some of the propaganda to make their political statement. So it's, it's kind of a bold move. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, and for anyone who wants to study for the McDonald's dropout of Russia, there is a great article in Foreign Affairs uh, recently uh, that really broke down all the thought processes they went through to, to try to make the decision. Thank you. Next question. Alex Knight in Vancouver, Canada says, if you feel good about a rebrand, how much should you pay attention to negative feedback online? Go ahead, Christopher. I'd say consider where, where that feedback is coming from. Um, as we kind of touched on earlier, um, people are going to naturally be resistant to change. So expect some type of uh, pushback, but gauge, gauge where that's coming from. Are the stakeholders, are the people that you're trying to reach, are, the, are they the ones that are, um, are putting um, the negative feedback on it? Or are these people, how close, how much of a stakeholder are these people that are um, posting online? Go ahead, Bill. I, there's a there's a a side to this that I was surprised. I used to write for Video Maker Magazine, and one of the things I, I went, oh, nobody disliked what I read. I got no comments, and I eventually realized that was a terrible thing. I wasn't saying enough to engage people to make them comment. And now that I'm now that I'm a little more sophisticated later in life, I kind of want you know one, two, three, four, five percent, whatever it is, but I want some pushback. When I put something out there, I want somebody to tell me, you know, you were wrong in this aspect of it because it means I engaged them. I said something worth critique. If you, and what I find is if I'm just doing bland weasel words and I'm not really saying anything, there is going to be no negative feedback, but there's also going to be very little positive feedback and whatever I'm writing could be completely ignorable, which is the worst thing, I think. And that negative feedback also might not necessarily come, you know, once that change happens. So I would uh, encourage um, you to look at look at it over a period of time, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, even up to a year. And because there's never there's never any, not any negative feedback and, and documenting that feedback so that you can. So sorry, going back to just you you t pay attention to it because it's important because that those are stakeholders but as bill said like who is it coming from you want to look at your core audience first and then the folks on the peripheral well just see if they have something that negative feedback still might be positive because it's something that you didn't identify and that can help you down the road in further product and brand development next question Kent King in Charlotte, North Carolina, the U.S., comes up with for profit client uh, for no profit clients using fundraising sites. Do you have a favorite, like one that's taken the smallest cut but still have great features? Christopher, I am trying to think of the platform that you use. Uh, Know that there, there it's, it seems to be that there are more and more funding platforms that have have come um, come up. The the one right now in this moment that's only mentally coming to me is GoFundMe, um, but I know that I've seen a number of them in the past um, in the past year. Kent, if you can put this question in the Discord and tag me so that I'll, I'll get that notification. I can come back and, and add that with a little bit more research, but there are definitely a, a plethora of them because even the major ones, I'm seeing that they are now like creating subsidiary um, platforms as well. So, next question. Stefan Fischer in Würzburg, Germany, uh, comes up with, how important do you consider a um, brand's slogan compared to all the visual materials? What are your thoughts on that, Christopher? That's a good, I think that's a good question. Um, I, is, I, I've seen where um, 
think about how the slogan is, is used. Is it just something that you're putting on a t-shirt or if you're putting on your materials, or is it something that embodies what your organization and the people that work for it for it um believe? Um, do people even know what it is? I, so you have to think about how is it how is it serving the organization? And there may be instances where you utilize your the logo, but you don't always have a slogan on there. So I think um, I would recommend seeing how how the serving organization is it a mantra or is it something that embodies the values of the organization that we can kind of use to to motivate our employees every day, or is it something that we're just putting out there? I would say go for something that that's meaningful both to you and your stakeholders. And do you have a a slogan at Chris One Eighty? Because I'm hearing slogan, but slogan tagline. Those yeah. are essentially the same. Like, like my brain is going like marketing, advertising wise, as the same things. Yeah, we. I feel like slogan has more of a, a for profit or sales connotation. Um, we have a, a tagline which is um, changing lives, changing directions, and um, so that kind of encompasses kind of our, our mission and our goal. So I think you. Just think about how how it plays out in other arenas at, as to just put it in out there. Okay, that makes sense, Bill. This caused me to think about the famous McDonald's tagline, you deserve a break today. I remember thinking about that in the early days when they were just, it, it was everywhere out there and how smart that was because fast food is often the, I'm tired, I don't want to mess with cooking or anything else, I don't want to sit down. And so the idea of you just deserve a break today, it's okay to make this choice to take the easy way out and do this. That's a pretty powerful statement to burn into people's minds about your brand. And I think it did them a lot of good for the years they used it. Um, you know, obviously they've, they've become such a juggernaut that I don't think they need anything anymore. I mean, just the arches is so powerful in terms of uh, a symbol of consistency and you know exactly what you're gonna get and you know it's going to be convenient, and it's got so many aspects to the brand that are burned in that it's not as required to do anymore. But I do think that was pretty brilliant marketing back when they did it. And Courtney? Well, the obvious answer is that a, a slogan uh, you know, transcends media because you can use it in print form in your print advertising, and you can use it in audio form for your radio advertising or any type of advertising that doesn't involve visuals. So... Uh, it can become very important to associate it with your brand, especially if you're, you know, uh, promoting your brand on podcasts, things like that, that are non-visual. A great logo doesn't mean anything on a radio show. You know? That sounds like a tagline right there. Thanks for, for that ad in there, Courtney. And bringing in Chris Clark's comment in the chat, the slogan of the streaming service AMC is only the good stuff makes me smile every time. So to your point there, Courtney, that it transcends media. Next question. Next question comes from Bobby Rafferty in Central Florida, and he says, how does guest satisfaction relate to a brand? Christopher, I'll give you the almost the final word. <laughs> I'd say guest satisfaction is definitely, uh, it's a test point because as I said earlier, um, a brand is kind of the sum of all the different touch points that a person has with your brand. So ultimately, you want all of those different interactions to come probably at the end so that your customer or potential customer, they are giving you that 100% or that A at the end of the customer satisfaction. So I think it's a, and it's also a, a tool that you can use to kind of gauge how people are interacting, um, what their what their takeaway is when they are interacting with your brand. So it can be a tool for you to gauge and make improvements along the way. Bill, real quick. Real quick, just be con congruent. If you're promising something in your brand and your marketing materials and you're not delivering it, you're going to fail really quickly because people understand that if you if your brand is where the cheapest in town and everybody starts to realize you're twenty percent more than everybody else. They're not going to come back. And Tony. Yeah, I just want to share that one of the things that I am obsessed with is that my guests have a good experience and that the audience have a good experience on what I do. 
Well, thank you so much, Christopher, for coming on and speaking to us. We've done a lot of conversations around just branding and personal branding, but then the actual communications, the visual, the digital communications. And do you have any parting words for our viewers? Well, thank you. For, thank you again for having me. I say definitely consider consistency, consider the total experience of the brand, not just the logo and the whole customer journey that you want individuals to have when they interact with your organization or your business or nonprofit. So thank you so much for this time. Thank you again, Christopher. And thank you to our producers for your questions, for the chat, for our panelists. Thank you for your contributions and answering the questions. And of course, to our production team who make us look and sound amazing each and every week. For those of you who want to know what's happening for the rest of the week, head over to officehours.global. And now we'll head into after hours. Bye, all. This is where we whisper for our after hours slogan. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, what, what is our after hours slogan? Whisper. I, don't, I think the slogan should be it's always after hours yeah, for somebody. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, it's always after hours somewhere. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Liberty. Great job. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so thank you, Christopher. And yeah, you can feel